if you are chewing a lot of gum, please put a stop to it. If you have your laptops on watching movies, you know the rules. You, yes, if you are sleeping, you are marked as not being in this class. Yeah, so please put your laptops down. This is not a place for laptops, unless you were not here last week, but you know the rules. Hello, I'm waiting for the two of you. Yes, so um, for today's uh, class, we are pleased to have in our midst the Member of Parliament for North Tongue in the Volta region. Um, he served as Minister of State Deputy Minister of State, uh, two times at the Minister of Information, and then also at the Ministry of Education. Uh, in contemporary times, we always regard him as being the youngest minister ever. At the age of 28, he became a Deputy Minister. He has served the people of North Tong, I think this is third time in office, so he's going 12 years in Parliament. Uh, before that, he attended the University of Ghana, where he also served as uh, President of the uh, Ghana Union of Students, NUCS. Before going to Legon, uh, our speaker for today completed uh, some Presec boys, Presbyterian boys secondary school, and he's very proud of that. And I know there are a couple of them here as well. Uh, at Presec, he was Scripture Union them here as well. Uh, at Presec, he was Yes. And in and out of Parliament, he's been a shining example to many people within this country and outside. Um, I want you to put your hands together. Let's welcome our speaker for today. <laughs> the Honorable Samuel Okujato Ablakwa. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Eugene, for those very kind words. I wonder why there was a loud cheer when you heard I was in the was Scripture Union president. It will appear that um, it will appear that um, not many associate uh, with politics, isn't it? Um, I guess, guess I will have been a reverend minister if I'm back on this political journey. And it's probably never too late uh, to uh, at some point drop the 1992 constitution and uh, pick up the Bible again. I would like to thank the management of the university for inviting me to participate in this leadership series. I consider it a privilege to be here today. I have been talking about the Academic City University. Uh, those of you who followed my debate and contributions in Parliament at the height of COVID-19. I commended this university highly, the visionary and very pragmatic efforts of Professor Fred Bagonluri and your engineering colleagues for coming up with what I found very fascinating, the low-cost ventilators that you invented right here in this university, which reverberated across the world. It made news. Uh, I actually uh, heard about it uh, listening to international news. 
And I took it to Parliament. I was very excited. And I argued that there should be some funding for you, some concerted effort, uh, so that we can, uh, as it were, um, industrialize the invention, uh, find a way of uh, putting it out there on the market to help us in our, our COVID-19 response. I haven't followed through uh, to uh, know exactly what has happened uh, after that, that invention. But let me commend you uh, and the team here for making all of us proud and for showing that young people can achieve, young people are doers, and what you are acquiring here, the knowledge you are acquiring here, is really to solve problems, is to ensure that we find solutions to the everyday challenges that, that we face. So I would like to commend you highly uh, for that and many other laurels that you have chalked. A relatively uh, new university, as you know, I used to work in the tertiary education space some years ago as Deputy Minister for Education in charge of tertiary education. And I know about your uh, history. I know about uh, the vision of uh, Professor Magbagon Luri and uh, the antecedents of, of this institution. And to come here today and to see how fast uh, this university has grown in leaps and bounds, uh, it's, it's really impressive. And uh, it is definitely a um, testimony of the uh, vision and the quality of intellectuals that, that you have here. So today we'll be having a very interesting discussion. Um, the theme that I will be speaking on, and this is going to be very interactive. Uh, I would be asking a lot of questions and wanting to also hear from you. Uh, I'm not here uh, to just dump. I'm here so I can also learn from you. So it's going to be a two-way affair. I want this to be as conversational uh, as, as possible. So we'll be speaking uh, to the topic Pan-Africanism and the next generation of African leaders, staying right in the midst of, of wrong. It's a topic that I'm really passionate about, and we really cannot be discussing this at any other moment in, in, our, in our history. It's a very, very, very timely, timely, timely topic. Why do I say it's, it's timely? Currently, a major discussion underway in our country is the return to the Britain Woods. You have all heard that Ghana has opened another round of negotiations with the IMF. Can anybody tell me the number, this particular round? What is, what is the number? We've gone to the IMF a number of times. So how many times have we been to the IMF? Anybody knows? <laughs> uh, do we have some, some economic students here? But it's really generally about the story of African leadership. So even beyond economics, I think that we should know about it. It's about our history. The history of the country that hosts our university, even though I know there are a lot of international students here. Okay, so let's make progress. This is the 18th. Can you believe that? The 18th, since the late 1960s. This is the 18th time that we have had to run to the IMF for some bailout of a sort. And uh, they have come under all kinds of 
uh, names and guises and branding and rebranding and all of that. The IMF and the World Bank have also been conscious about the harsh effects, the bitter pills that particularly African countries have had to swallow any time we've had a round of these uh, negotiations and programs. And so uh, they've also rebranded. There's been a lot of talk earlier on about conditionalities. Uh, when the IMF arrives, they'll tell you you have to uh, engage in redundancy. And what is redundancy? Laying off workers in the public sector, reducing the size of government. Uh, they'll tell you you must close some industries, some state-owned enterprises. Government has no business doing business. It's largely the right-wing capitalist ideology. And there are all kinds of painful fiscal remedies that they will normally uh, provide. And so we've gone through all of that, uh, whether it's sub one, sub, sub two, the structural adjustment program, whether it's PAMS card, uh, trying to mitigate the effect of structural adjustment. You can call it whatever form. The last time under President Mahama, it was known, under, known as an extended credit facility. You know, uh, we are waiting to hear how this will be called. But very nice names. But really, um, what it does remind all of us about is that very poignant, unforgettable soundbite from the Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah of 6 March 1957, when he declared our independence. When the Osajifu said that the black man will show the world that we are capable of managing our own affairs. Ah, quite a paradox, isn't it? Um, so Nkrumah will be turning in his grave and will be wondering, did he speak too early? Um, didn't he prepare his children very well? Um, what has happened that uh, since he was overthrown in 1966, who remembers the day he was overthrown? There's something interesting about that day and contemporary history. Who remembers? This, uh, they, we, are, we are having, we are reminding ourselves of our pan Africanist knowledge. 24 February 1966 is when the Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown. I think that that was really the day that marked a major setback, Ghana's day of shame. Uh, we have really uh, not regained our part of progress since, since, since that time, uh, when the traitors of the National Reconstruction Effort uh, overthrew the Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Now, I did say earlier, before I forget as I move on, that that day reminds us of contemporary history. Um, who, who, who wants to remind us of that contemporary history? What happened on the 24th of February this year, just this year? This class is not alive. Do you need some coffee? <laughs> uh, uh, what happened? What happened on, uh, on, on 24 February this year? This class is not alive. Do you need some coffee? <laughs> uh, uh, what happened? What happened on, uh, on, on 24 February this year? The person who changed the course of contemporary geopolitics is celebrating his birthday today. Which world leader is celebrating his birthday today? Was somebody, att was somebody attempting an answer at the back? <laughs> so you have only been reading your notes and you haven't made time for international news. 
And I guess that um, in your spare time, you are uh, just catching up on TikTok videos, isn't it? And Instagram photos. And uh, not engaging in the boring business of uh, following the international news wire. But it can be interesting. Mm? It can be interesting. I want you guys to develop an interest in international politics, international relations. And you see how it's very interrelated to what you are learning and the full implication of all of the knowledge you are acquiring here. So Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, invaded Ukraine on the 24th of February this year. So that's the answer I'm looking for. So 24 February 1966, there was another invasion. An invasion in the absence of the Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Who remembers where he was when the coup took place? Fantastic. He was in Vietnam. Fantastic. I knew that, I knew that this class was, had more potential and capacity than, than uh, you were making it to be. Um, and it tells you the towering figure. Uh, the Osajifu was being sought after to mediate in the war uh, in Vietnam and largely uh, seeking for a truce uh, between the Americans and the Vietnamese. That's the kind of figure, a towering international figure, an international statesman. Many of you may not have heard of the non-aligned movement, but that was Kwame Nkrumah's idea. Together with Tito, Nehru of, of, uh, of India, and the Egyptian leader at the time, they came together and formed the non-aligned movement. At the time, when it was not fashionable, when people were rushing to align, like we've seen today, rushing to align with the East or the West, and that was during the Cold War. You know about the Cold War, don't you? Kwame Nkrumah thought that there should rather be a third force, a non-aligned movement, where we should seek for global peace. We will come later, later to underscore the importance of all of this. But as we discuss Pan-Africanism, it is important to ask ourselves, what is Pan-Africanism? Can anybody hazard a guess? What is Pan-Africanism? Yes. Fantastic, fantastic. So Pan-Africanism is, is a movement. It's a political force that Africans are one people. We have a common desti destiny. We have a common history. And Pan-Africanism transcends borders. When you are a Pan-Africanist, you do not discriminate against fellow black people because you recognize that a lot of the boundaries that we operate within today are very artificial. You know that, don't you? You know that these are very artificial boundaries. Ghana, Togo, Benin, you know it's a very recent creation. Where were these borders created? Where were these borders created? And who presided over that meeting? You've heard of the Berlin Conference, haven't you? So we need to, we need to go a, a lot deeper into our Pan-Africanist knowledge. So all the borders you see today, 
are very artificial. The Europeans met in Germany in the mid-19th century, around 18, the 1840s, under the German chancellor at the time. What was his name? Yeah, Otto von Bismarck, and decided to demarcate uh, Africa amongst, amongst themselves. Now, the Pan-African story, or what we should all empower ourselves with, is the knowledge that the African story is not the story of today. And it's not a story of these artificial boundaries. Or what Otto von Bismarck and his colleagues did. Or what has become the dominant narrative about Africa. I want us to spend some time to understand who we are as Africans where we have come from. To appreciate Pan-Africanism and to call yourself a Pan-Africanist, you must be conscious of your heritage and where the African people have come from. And sadly, the dominant narrative today, particularly for your generation, and it has not been aided much by the plethora of failed leadership across the continent, is that oh, Africa is a basket case. Africa is the land of poverty. Africa is synonymous to conflict, to war, to deprivation. That's where you find a lot of destitutes, unemployment squalor, and all of that. Please take that out of your minds. That is a myth which has to be demolished. And no African intellectual must buy that. It is important to recognize that the history of humankind, the history of civilization, is one that has Africa playing a lead role. It is in the interest of some operatives and actors to keep pushing that narrative that Africa has always been subservient, Africa has always been backward, Africa has always been unenlightened. We have never been and we will never be. Those who push that narrative simply do not know their history. When you go back into history, the name that was chosen at the dawn of our new independent status, Ghana, I'm sure you do know that Ghana had existed many, many centuries ago. I hope you know that. As the Ghana Empire, about 800 AD. And all the accounts about that Ghana Empire, which was between present day Senegal, sprawling all the way to Togo, the Senegal River, the Niger river, that Ghana empire, scholars agree that it was 
the height of civilization, of commerce at the time, of deep intellectual studies. It was a center of learning, and it was a very successful, it was an empire that was very reputable, and it was the envy of many other empires. And they were all Africans. The history is very, very clear. So, when you know this history, you do not allow anyone to look down on you or to limit your capacity and your potential. Out of the Ghana Empire, you know about the invasion of the Almoravids in 1075. And then after that, we had the Malian Empire. But it's important to remember that in between that, when the Ghana Empire was invaded, it was an Islamic invasion by the Tuaregs and the Berbers. And I would like you to read more about this because these days you hear of Tuareg rebels and you think it's all negativity. But I'm not talking about the current Tuareg rebels who may be classified as terrorists. I'm talking about the Tuaregs of old, who were also very enlightened, sophisticated North Africans. The Berbers, B-E-R-B-E-R, -E -E not Barbers, mm -hmm. the, the, the Berbers. Um, you may want to read more about them, and uh, I would like you to note uh, about these very important kingdoms. By the time they invaded the Ghana Empire in 1075, you'll notice that Africa was really a cradle of civilization. And you must recognize that. There's nothing wrong about the Africans' skin, the Africans' brains, the, Afri the Africans' capacity. Absolutely nothing wrong. All the way, Malian Empire, the Songhai Empire, all the way to even modern day Egypt. And literature is replete about how organized we were, the level of economic advancement before. The so-called people who came to discover Africa. What I hate about history, <laughs> about historiography, is this claim that some people come and discover others. You know, we are here in our continent, in our kingdoms. We have our own way of life. We have our language. We never ask for help. We didn't call for an IMF bailout. And then you get into a ship. And then you have come as a thief at night to steal our gold, our ivory, our diamond, our, our silk, our bauxite, our timber. You are the plunderers. You are the damn criminals who are coming to use force, not invited. And then you claim that you, you have come to discover us. Discover us for who? You know? So, again, Pan-Africanists don't believe in that, you know, discovery, Baldadash. You know, we, uh, that we were some, you know, we're living in some stone age, knew nothing about how to survive, about humanity, and then they brought us education you know that's 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 another another joke you know uh they and they, they brought us mirrors you hear all kinds of you know lousy stuff 
which has been totally discredited. If you read up on your history, totally discredited. Somebody like Basil Davidson, and you can write down that name, Basil Davidson, that's, that's an important historian to read after. He spent all his life researching on these empires I talk about and the African civilization and the African people. And, and what I like about this reference is that Basil Davidson is a British journalist. Mm -hmm. So he's not African who you say that is trying to present the story from a biased perspective. He is one of the so-called imperialists or colonialists. But yet, he does not fall. His research, extensive research, very authentic intellectual work. Basil Davidson totally disproves that. So all of those notions that you hear, oh, and they were so kind, Vasco da Gama, uh, Prince Henry the Great and uh, uh, Bartholomew uh, Dias. Uh, I'm mentioning names of the so-called great European sailors who came to discover us. Mm. That big myth. I would like to quote an extract from Basil Davidson. What he describes of our ancestors, by the time the Europeans arrived. And this is from his book, Old Africa Rediscovered. And you may want to uh, take note of that. It's published by Victor Golang's Limited, a 1959 publication. And this is what Basil Davidson notes. They anchored in havens that were thick with ocean shipping. They went ashore to cities as fine as all but a few they could have known in Europe. They watched a flourishing maritime trade in gold and in iron and ivory and tortoise shell, beads and copper and cotton cloth, slaves and porcelain, and saw that they had stumbled on a world of commerce, even larger and perhaps wealthier than anything that Europe knew. To these European sailors, of the last years of the 15th century, the coast of Eastern Africa could have seemed no less civilized than their own coast of Portugal. In the matter of wealth and knowledge of a wider world, it must have seemed a great deal more civilized. They were repeatedly surprised by the ease and substance of the ports and towns they saw and sheltered in and plundered. They found themselves repeatedly disregarded are strange and uncouth. We were not the uncouth ones. We were not the ones who needed education. That is how we saw them. When we had been two or three days at this place, says the laconic logbook of Dagame's flagship, that's Vasco Dagame's flagship, the Sao Gabriel, of an encounter at a port that was probably Quilemin, above the Zambezi River, two centuries of the century, came to see us. They were very haughty and valued nothing which we gave them. One of them wore a cap with a fringe em embroidered in silk, and the other a cap of green silk, a young man in their company. So we understood from their signs that they had come from a distant country and had already seen big ships like ours. They had already seen big ships like ours. And you see the quality of clothing, silk, the caps that they wore, and the fact that they were not enamored. So all of those dominant propagandist narrative about how they were welcomed and hailed as saviors and we were in a hurry, you know, to get them to liberate us. It's not true. That's just uninformed, uneducated propaganda. 
which as young intellectuals, you should not fall for. So there are over 20 books by Basil Davidson that I'll encourage you to uh, lay hands on, and very authentic work. He managed to secure the diaries of all of these sailors and people who were ashore these ships, and their own words, how astonished they were at the African people they met. Now, why am I spending time on all of this history? It is because I realize that as we engaged and as we discuss, I read on social media and all of that, many people seem to think that the challenges that we face economic challenges, challenges with job creation, you know, fixing our roads. Coming here, I know how worried you are about your roads, you know, and, 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 and all of that. People want to make it an African problem. It's not. Please don't fall for that. We are great people. We have a great heritage. If those who came after the collapse of the Ghana Empire the Malian Empire, the Songhai Empire, the great Egyptian civilization, have decided to be lazy, have decided to be selfish, have decided to be corrupt. It has nothing to do with the color of our skin. It has nothing to do with the quality of our character. It has nothing to do with the capacity of our brains. And it is important for us to recognize that. And that should then challenge us that as young African intellectuals, we will change this warped narrative. We are going to position ourselves in a way that we shall go back to those glorious days. I know some of you may be thinking that, okay, so if we were so great, in history, how come we were defeated? That is an, a seemingly obvious question, but not an intellectual question. The fact that you were defeated by some other force does not mean that you were not great or you didn't have civilization, you didn't have education. What you must recognize is that, is that world history is replete with the rise of empires and the fall of empires. And the fact that you had down times with your empire doesn't mean that you were not great. And there is no empire. Indeed, literature is now clear that empires will rise and fall. It is not possible to sustain an empire forever. It is not. And that is why the Roman Empire, one of the greatest empires of human history, rose but still fell. The British Empire, which some have argued is the greatest of all time, and a few weeks ago, the queen was being celebrated. I take the view that you can mourn the queen in a dignified manner, give her the respect she deserves, but you can still condemn her empire. Her empire which did thrive on plunder, on pillage, on slavery of the African people. She herself, in her entire reign of 70 years, never tried to defend that. She walked away from it and tried to rebrand the British monarchy, albeit without an apology of the past. And I think that that's one of the uh, regrets that the monarchy must have about the reign of Queen Elizabeth. She should have opened about, about the past, and she should have apologized uh, to African people. Her son, the current king, uh, 
did attempt an apology of a sort, uh, even though it was half-hearted. Uh, a few years ago in Rwanda at a Commonwealth uh, meeting when he said that upon reflection, the monarchy you know, has not really been fair to uh, the African people and that he's still thinking about that. I wonder what really he's still thinking about uh, on a matter which is, which is so obvious and so settled. But the point I make is that throughout history, you have had empires that will rise and fall. And the fact that the Ghana Empire, the Malian Empire, the Songhai Empire rose and fell, don't question who we are, our great, our gravitas, our intellectual capacity, our ability to also contribute. And so when you hear people say, oh, what has been Africa's contribution to, uh, to, to the forward march of mankind? Enormous. In every field. Absolutely every field. There is no field of human endeavor that you will not find a pioneering role of African scholars. And again, as Pan-Africanists, you should know about the colleges of education in Timbuktu. Timbuktu, before Socrates emerged, before Plato emerged, Timbuktu was the center of higher learning. And that is a fact. It's been settled. Indeed, there are books from scholars out of Timbuktu. Books like Tariq El Sudan. Air is E-S, El Sudan. Uh, Tariq. L, and this is L, not E-S, E-L, Tariq L. Felak. I'll, I'll give you these spellings um, uh, more clearly uh, when, 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 when we get into the discussion session. And these are books that are from Timbuktu, adopted by universities in Spain, England, as of the American universities, they came later. So it should tell you that, that claim that, oh, so what have the Africans contributed? What really has been their, their, their value? Again, it is ignorance speaking. It is lack of research. It is just empty, uh, hot air. So I want us to value our history to value our heritage. Don't underestimate what that does to your self-confidence. Don't underestimate what that does to your capacity to say that, look, if it is my ambition to get into leadership, whether it's in the corporate world, whether it is in the political world, whether it is in academia, I Going back to Nkrumah, we show the world that the black man is capable. And beyond even managing his own affairs, he can manage other affairs. That is important. We must know our history. And we must know who we are if we say we are Pan-Africanists. So I'll be transitioning now to some contemporary developments about leadership because uh, uh, Eugene told me that he wanted me to share some practical experiences as MP, some of my interventions and all of that to bring home the discussion. Before I do that, I want us to watch this video uh, of, of an Indian commentator who was commenting on India's position India's current position on the Russia-Ukraine conflict and why India adopts the position that it has adopted right from the UN uh, General Assembly and its you know, posture generally about, about the war. Uh, so, yes, that's it. So, you know, let's I, I've been it. saying that... 
is that today the West is trying to chastise the world's largest democracy, India, and sermonizing that this is the stand India should take and that is the stand India should take. And I'd like to tell you, we have taken a stand. We are not going to fight a battle with Russia. That is a Western creation. This is a creation of the West. We are abstaining. We did not cause this war, Sean. We did not cause this war, and we will look out for ourselves. Because don't you for a moment think that we have forgotten history, Sean. I'd like to remind you uh, that, that the UK and the US moved a joint resolution in the UN Security Council deploring the use of force by India in Goa, Daman, and Diu when we were liberating Goa, and it was the USSR at that time that vetoed it. And let me also tell you, I don't forget 1971. The US tried to actively harm my country in 1971, where after Pakistan uh, you know, launched Operation Chengiz Khan against India, it was the US that rallied with Pakistan and dispatched a 10-ship naval task force, the US task force, from the 7th Fleet of the South Vietnam into the Bay of Bengal, and we still won in Bangladesh. So please, we cannot trust the Americans. We should never completely trust the Americans. Now for the British, because Sean, you're British, I, I, I think it's a great country. I love Great Britain, but my question here is very simple. We cannot forget how in 1971 the UK dispatched its aircraft carrier HMS Eagle into the Arabian Sea to bolster Pakistan and then retreated after the Russian fleet was spotted. So no, I do not forget my country's history. And, and you tried to pass resolutions against us in 1971 when, when the people of Bangladesh were being plundered and raped and murdered at that point of time when we were liberating Pakistan, you tried to pass a resolution against us. And while UK and France abstained, Russia vetoed it. So I never forget my country's history. And I truly believe that a great country like India will look out for itself. And I'm completely a believer in the recalibration of the world order. And while I condemn the casualties in Ukraine, I think we are doing a damn good thing and I'm proud of my country for standing up for itself. Fantastic. <clears throat> so, do we, do we have any Indian here? <laughs> excellent, excellent. I, I love the Indians. They are always proud of their history. They always remember their history. And you saw his recitals, you saw his dates, and you saw what is informing their position on the Russia-Ukraine war. And why they are deciding that they are not going to carry other people's burdens and be used as pawns. They are not going to get involved. And they remember in times where Russia was there for them. And you do know that they were also colonized by the British, don't you? You know that, right? And a few days ago, uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, was, 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 was celebrated, you know, uh, his peaceful methodology to political activism, you know, seen as the icon of peace. Um, but from that video, that's the kind of spirit, that's the kind of verb, the kind of energy that Pan-Africanism must have about our history. I work in the foreign affairs space as a ranking member on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And to tell you honestly, with the history I know about Africa, about our ancestry, sometimes some of the positions we take on global affairs, I don't understand it. I don't know where that history is. Recently, Ghana's foreign minister shocked the country when she probably was the first country, country's foreign minister from Africa to announce that we are not going to recognize the annexed territories of Donbass. Putin must be warned and he should be careful and all of that. You know, and Ghana wouldn't recognize those territories, you know. She was speaking like a superpower, you know. 
as if Putin really cares if Ghana doesn't recognize, you know. You know. I don't know if I don't know if Putin saw the news, but you can only wonder his his reaction when he saw Ghana's foreign minister threatening Russia and saying we won't recognize the annexed Ukrainian territories. You know, you can imagine the smack on Vladimir's face. But back to the substantive point that I seek to make. By the time Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown on the 24th of February 1966, if there was any European country that was really an ally that was really helping Ghana, if you go into our history, these are Russians. Kindly read up on the Ghana Atomic Agency. Ghana was on the verge of becoming a nuclear power. Because remember, Kwame Nkrumah had argued that the only way to stop the threat of nuclear warfare was either nobody has nuclear weapons or we all have it. Why do you think that the West is so scared of Russia? And yesterday, President Biden said that, look, let's not take Putin's threats for granted. You shouldn't take it lightly. This threat of technical nuclear weapon use. He might mean it. And so they are very careful. They are supporting Ukraine behind the scenes, giving them a lot of weapons, a lot of money. But they are careful not to launch a missile into Moscow or any Russian city for that matter. So Kwame Nkrumah's view is that, look, let's all have it, and then it serves as a checkmate. Then everybody will be careful. Or total nuclear abolishment. Nobody should have it. When the non-aligned movement pushed that, and they saw that, look, the, the nuclear armed race was continuing all the way to the 1962 missile crisis over Cuba, he then decided that, look, we must also prepare. And it's the Russians who came to our aid. Russian engineers. There are a lot of them here. So, it's not too clear, you know, sometimes whether we, remem we, 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 um, we, we remember our history and our friends. And even the consistency, the consistency. I am all for an objective discussion about respecting sovereignty and not invading countries and not colonizing people, particularly because of our own history. That's an objective discussion we can have. But why is our foreign minister not showing the same zeal, bravado, bombastic statements on the atrocities taking place in Palestine. Palestinian territories are being invaded on a daily basis by the Israelis. Apartheid in their own country. They have violated the 1948 UN resolution, the General Assembly resolution. Why can't we show same consistency? What about Western Sahara? And you can read up on the plight of the people of Western Sahara. We don't have time now, so just read up on their plight. Colonialism taking place right before our eyes. Morocco and Western Sahara. Why is it that when it comes to those matters, same principles, we seem to be pussyfooting. We don't see certain things. We don't want to say certain things. But then when it comes to Russia, Ukraine, 
we appear so... And you see, as Pan-Africanists, when apartheid was going on in South Africa, we saw Nelson Mandela ended up in prison for about 27 years. Read up on the Battle of Quito Canavaro. Read up on that battle. The Battle of Quito Canavaro. And whose side the USSR was on. That is why you notice that the South Africans always have a soft spot. I mean, black South Africans. They have a soft spot for the Russians. They came to their aid, assisted. Ghana was also on their side. We sent troops. This was in the 1980s. And we defeated the white South African forces in that battle, which is the biggest conventional warfare to take place on the soil of Africa. We had USSR support. We had Russian support. So, do we remember our history? Do we always remember our allies? Do we always remember our friends? And the principle, the consistency of it, it is important. And as Pan-Africanists, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And we must be consistent. Now, how do all of these history we have been looking at, how should that relate to practical leadership? How should that relate to transforming a society? In my mind, that is what matters. If you are proud people, like this commendable Indian commentator is, and spelling out why they are being careful and they don't want to fight other people's wars for them because they are conscious of their history. At the end of the day, really, how does all of that transform it into or translate, that's the word I'm looking for. How does all of that translate into practical leadership, which appears to be in deficit now on the African continent? And let's be honest. Even as I go into history and I talk about the glorious days of Africa, I am honest to concede that in terms of our modern history, this is not where we belong. And this is not what we have always been. When I see how the Asian tigers, the so-called Asian tigers, you know them. South Korea, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, how they transform their society. In just 30 years, 30 years, they have become first-class society. Massive transformation. And see where Africa is. See where our country is. And ironically, that same 30 years is where the current Fourth Republic is. We have had that same 30 years. The 1992 constitution, we went into a referendum April 1992. We are exactly 30 years. And yet we can't compare ourselves. It tells you that there is a certain leadership deficit. Tell me if it makes sense that Auditor General's report after Auditor General's report talks about infractions, massive corruption. Indeed, if you put the last five Auditor General's report together, the financial irregularities amounts to about 50 billion Ghana cities. Can you believe that? 50 billion Ghana cities. 
And yet, we are chasing the IMF now for $3 billion over three years. If we are lucky to get it, that is just, at today's exchange rate, that is just some, what, $30 billion? Nowhere near the $50 billion that the Auditor General is saying that if only there was incorrigible, in, in, incorruptible, is the word I'm looking for, incorruptible leadership, where we are iron fist about fighting corruption, genuine about it. Sadly, the fight against corruption under this democratic dispensation has just been about trying to expose potential corruption of my opponents. So don't expect any real corruption fight. If I'm in power and it's my people, my party people engage in it, I don't see it. I see no evil here, no evil. I can't act on any evil. I'm looking for what may have happened during my predecessor's regime. We cannot develop our continent that way. But even as I speak about the current state of Africa, don't forget that, and often many commentators make that mistake, the African continent is not the same story. There are very amazing bright spots. Rwanda is a popular example. And we've seen what can, be, what can be achieved in less than 30 years. And I like to make this 30 year analogy very strongly. The Rwandans had killed themselves, Hutus, Tutsis, all the way to 1994 when the war ended. Over a million people died. They decided that, look, we need a new beginning and a new story and legacy for our children. And see what they have achieved. The cleanest city, the, the banned plastics, is the holiday destination, the conference destination of Africa. They are not making excuses about COVID-19, about Russia, Ukraine war. In this period, they have been able to increase salaries of their teachers by about 88%. Massive job creation. The stability. Yes, you can look at the human rights credentials of Kagame. But sometimes I believe that there's some, something to be said for strong leadership, discipline. Of course, not crossing the lines, the red lines, and violating people's rights, killing people, I would not endorse that. But you have to be strict. And we've seen that in, in, in Rwanda. John Magafuli, and you may want to read up on him. Unfortunately, he died in office. Tanzania, within a short time, doing the things that needs to be done, Magafuli transformed his country. This is a, this is a man who said, look, all these so-called independence parades and, we, and this national celebration, when you see the budget at the end of it, it's so expensive, expensive to the taxpayer. We'll use that money to rather buy equipment for our hospitals. Cut down on conferences by more than 80%. He himself would not attend. Traveled very few times. And never traveled first class. Very modest leadership. Nationalized. Renegotiated. They are agreements in the mineral sector. And Tanzania benefited greatly from it. See what is happening in our gold sector. The biggest discussion this season has been Galamse, isn't it? Who has been to Obuasi before? Who has been to Prestia? Who has been to Takwa? All those places where mining has been taking place over the last century. When you go there, don't you weep? Don't you cry for a country? What, what really are we getting from 
the large scale mining. So, in the process, indigenous people, Ghanaians, decided that look, we are better off doing the mining ourselves. And then the illegal aspect of that whole endeavor began. In my mind, the only practical solution in this Galamse matter, ban all mining, whether large scale, small scale, ban it now. Everything ought to be renegotiated. There has to be some nationalization. And then let's take a decision. Are we really ready? Do you know there are some countries that have oil reserves? They've decided that they are not going to explore. They won't touch it. We can decide that, look, we've done enough mining. Our environment should rest. And don't tell me about, oh, we'll lose revenue and all of that. No amount of revenue losses can compensate for the massive destructions. You are seeing all the health hazards. The deformed babies that are being born. The permanent injuries that people are suffering now. Kidney, lungs, all kinds of strain diseases, as the GMA is complaining about. So, there are real pan-African solutions. We don't need to go to the IMF a 19th time after this one. If only there will be sincere, quality, visionary leadership. Kwame, Kwame Nkrumah talked about Africa uniting, that Africa must unite. Imagine what can be achieved if we are a common market. After so many years, they are now trying to implement what he said with the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. Very late in the day. But just imagine if the almost a billion active market in this continent is put to full use, is industrialized, and we are trading amongst ourselves, the opportunities that that will create. So, there are real practical solutions based on that Pan-Africanist orientation, that Pan-Africanist mindset to solve modern day problems. A Pan-African leader in the true sense will not open our borders for the Chinese to come in and do whatever they want. And Aisha Huan is dribbling everybody and we are afraid to touch her. And the last time Aisha Wan was deported, you had a senior minister say that we were expecting some loan, the Sino Hydro facility from China, and they didn't want that jeopardized. In Tanzania, the Ivory Queen, their, their version of Aisha Wan. She's an ivory queen. She's called Yang Feng Lan. They arrested her, jailed her. She's still in jail for 15 years. It has not affected China-Tanzania relations. It is the Chinese who need us. Just like the slave raiders needed us, the so-called discoverers who discovered themselves and not us, needed us. Who has the gold? Who has the timber? Who has the bauxite? Who has all the natural resources? Africa is home. The wars in Congo are continuing because others are profiting from those wars. The divide and rule. They need us. So a Pan-Africanist leadership mindset will say, to hell with you, Aisha Huan. We will deal with you as our law demands. And the Chinese will even respect you for that. As I wind up to open the floor for your questions, your discussions, and all of that, I want to remind you that what we are discussing today, a true Pan-Africanist doesn't see this discussion as 
some crusade that must be waged in the distant future. It starts now. And it starts with you. And it starts while you are in school. That is the history of the liberation of the African people. And I'm glad that we are having this discussion in October. It was this same month, in October 1945, that African students, African scholars, studying all over Europe and America, decided that, look, enough is enough. We will not be here enjoying our universities and then our people, our fathers, our mothers, our uncles, our colleagues will be under subjugation, will be under colonialism. We will meet and begin the final push for the liberation of the continent. That was when the Pan-African Congress was held in Manchester in 1945, this same month of October. Out of that, you had Kwame Nkrumah becoming president of Ghana, Jomo Kenyatta becoming president of Kenya, Banda became pre president of Malawi. They began as students like you. I think that the current student is a bit too docile. And you see these matters as other people's business, the elder generation. This older generation, if you leave them, I don't consider myself part of them. Uh, and in 1945, it's the same plan that what we are complaining about today. It's just that the, the actors appear different. The Chinese are still using the old methodology sending their people here in droves. In any case, who is giving them visas? And who is allowing the Chinese to enter our country? Is it not us? Gunpoint to take over our natural resources. So it means that the current generation, we are even worse. I mean, we are, it's unbelievable. Then the others are using neo what Kwame Nkrumah calls neo-colonial methodologies. So unfair trade. Every now and then, when they are hot, the economies are heated, they are not doing very well. The latest is that uh, we won't import cocoa from your country if we see any trace of chemical, cyanide, mercury, if it's not environmentally friendly, so that they force you to hand over things to them at cheap prices. Always, they are setting the stone, the standards. Why really, after all these decades, should we care who is setting standards to buy our cocoa when we can add value, trade amongst ourselves, and they must rather come begging? It's only when it comes to geopolitical trade that is the buyer who, who always comes dictating and lording it over the one who owns the commodity. So, back to the main point I'm making. Don't think that these discussions and the forward march of our country, and I like the expression the Indian use, the recalibration of the current world order. Every human being created with inalienable rights, created by God, must have the same respect and the same value. Nobody should dictate to anybody. And nobody has the right to subject any other human being to discrimination, to racism, to subjugation. We must stand up for those principles. And we can stand up for them now. We don't have to wait to be elected into office or to be appointed into positions to 
pursue those causes and to make those values count as we all work towards the recalibration of the world, the building of a fair and just society that ensures that all of us have a fair shot of achieving our God-given dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure we all learned a thing or two uh, from this wonderful uh, lecture. Um, let me mention, Honorable, that this is supposed to be the level 200 class, right? Second year students. Uh, but even uh, with that, there are other students from other um, year groups, because I can see some of their seniors here as well. And uh, just so you also know, um, Honorable came along with an entourage of uh, okay. his assistants. Yeah. You know, um, I want to say thank you so much for coming. Uh, I can see Irene, I can see Gifty, I can see Blaze, I can see Kofi, I can see Fred, I can see Mr. Kwashi. There are a lot. And uh, they all came because of this. So let's put our hands together for them. So we have less than 30 minutes for contributions, for questions. I mean, some of you have already told me that you don't agree with some of the things he said when I was walking around. So this is the time. And it's a discussion. Don't, don't be afraid to take an opposing view. Uh, and if you have a question or a clarification to make, please do that. So the floor is open now. Just raise your hand. Where is the class rep? Yeah, please come. So you have to moderate this. So just raise your hand if you have a question. Okay, so one, two, three. So that's the first three I'll deal with. One, two, three. Then, so make your question, your clarification, make it very brief because we don't have so much time, okay? So thank you. My name is Emmanuel. Yeah, short one. Um, so, we all agree with the fact, or you all, we have all heard the fact that the black man is capable of managing his own affairs, but don't you think that um, the current state of the country, or the way we do things, doesn't it um, make mockery, or excuse my language, but make rubbish of the fact that a black man can handle his own affairs? Uh, my name is Ebenezer. Um, I'm a Ghanaian. Um, so my question is, you mentioned earlier on that um, in some of these countries or states where they are not totally um, democratic and they are kind of um, harsh with the way they do things, things tend to work better. So in this dispensation of free choice and freedom in everything that we do, do you think that um, that can ever work? as a system. Hi, I'm Joseph, I'm Nigerian. So I just want to make a comment that a, a big problem is we are not taught history, the proper history of Africa. Because even when I was in primary school, I was learning white man history. And even till today, although I have not grown much, but the same history is being taught. The latest African or Ghanaian history we are taught is when the white people came to invade us and, and slavery and all of that. So if you notice, when you were mentioning so many things about um, 850 AD and stuff like none of us knew anything so the the truth is what needs to be changed is from the educational system we need to be taught correct history of africa and like not to reduce the amount of white man history that we're taught basically yeah thank you
Okay. Well, let me. I'm sure we'll have a, we'll have a second round, right? Yes. We'll have a good. So we'll come to you in the second round. Let me uh, commend you for your questions. Very, very uh, insightful questions. I'll begin with Emmanuel, who is wondering if all the things happening now does not make a mockery of this whole, you know, Pan Africanist belief that a black man is capable of managing his own affairs. I did allude to that earlier in my, in, my, in my presentation, where I said that Nkrumah might be turning in his grave when he sees what is happening now. So you, you, you have a point there that there could be mockery, there could be even, if you like, despondency, and some may want to give up. But my focus, my, my agenda today is to fight that. We must not give up. And we must not see what is happening today, our sad trajectory today, even the return of coups, the failed states, uh, you know, across many, many, many countries in the continent, and say that that is really our plight and our cross. And that uh, I hear some people say that, look, now when the ships arrive, we'll not even wait for them to come and arrest us. We will jump into the ships. We will go. Uh, can slavery come back? And all of those things sometimes I see on social media. Like, Do these guys know what they are talking about? We are talking about killings. You know, large villages, communities destroyed. We are talking about pillage, plunder, open stealing, you know, of our natural resources, which really has contributed to us lacking behind. You know, because there was never any reparation, there was no compensation. Uh, 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 whatsoever. But again, that should not be an excuse. I am not. There are two schools of thought. There are those who say, look, let's fight for reparation. Uh, we need that before we can make it. I belong to another school of thought that says, that, look, let's just learn lessons. Many empires have had that uh, invasion, attacks. They've been defeated. You know, they've had downsides. But really, we can't wait for others to come and help us or atone for their sins. We can make it. And that's why I talk about the bright spots in Africa, where some countries, even those who have gone through the harshest, after all of the slavery, colonialism, neocolonialism, where they even suffered civil war. Fortunately, in Ghana, we escaped civil war. Rwanda is the example. And yet, see where they are today. So it's just about true Pan-Africanist, visionary, committed leadership. A leadership that is genuine. I mean, a lot of the things going on, I, it's, it's not rocket science. It's not rocket science. If, look, we can just love our country a little. If we can just ensure that we add value, we change the structure of our economy, and that we mean what we say and say what we mean. I mean, I mean how difficult should it be to keep Chinese looters out of our, our, our forests? How, how difficult should that be? We issued the visas in Beijing. We can't stop that. We can put a moratorium. I mean, what did we do to the Americans some two, three years ago when they said that, look, they are not happy with how our embassy was treating uh, the immigrants who must be removed from America. So because of that, they are imposing visa restrictions on us. Even Teachers in universities, MPs, ministers, we're not getting US visas. It's their right. We can't do that. We can't stand up to China and protect our environment. You know? So it's just about failed leadership. Sometimes they say that every society gets the leaders they deserve. Probably there's some truth in there because we elect them. And uh, I don't know what due diligence we do. How do we really go into? You know, and sometimes that is the challenge with democracy, but it's still probably the best form of gov government invented. Democracy tends to produce popular leaders, you know, uh, sweet talkers, um, people who can give you good sound bites to, you know, come up with, you know, mouth-watering promises, so you elect them. But they may not necessarily, the popular leaders may not necessarily it's not always that popular leaders and result-oriented leaders, visionary leaders, tally. 
The likes of Kwame Nkrumah are very few in history who are able to combine their popularity and still have very, you know, vision and all of that. So your question is very deep, multifaceted. Even the kind of assessment that electorates carry out before, you know, we vote and all of that. And then how we hold leaders accountable. I think that leaders are having a field day in Africa and this part of the world. Field day. Why should we accept the levels of destruction going on in our environment, the economic mess, and all of that? Why should we accept? I'm doing some work currently. When I'm done, it will shock you people. I'm just department by department. I am tallying retired people who should go home but have been given contract. And yet the youth are complaining about unemployment. And it's true, they have to complain. The population housing census says that population, uh, the, the current population of the unemployed is at an all-time high, 13.4%. And yet, people who should go home, who we should say, thank you very much, you served us well, 30 years, 40 years, go home, take a rest, they are being given contracts. And when I'm, I'm going through, some of the, it's not some specialized field. It's, not, it's nothing that the youth cannot do. And it's not once, not twice. The constitution says that they can have a first contract, two years, a second contract of two years, and then the last one of one year. You know, meanwhile, the youth are home looking for jobs. Already the numbers I'm seeing, staggering. So we, have, we are also allowing it. We are allowing it. Elsewhere, when I see how they hold their leaders accountable, you know, um, we still have that kinship, chieftaincy mindset, where we see our leaders as chiefs. Nana bao, oh, nana kasa din, you know, and, um, and we think that the leaders are doing us a favor. And I don't say this because I'm in opposition. I'm also a leader. I'm an MP, and I expect that if I'm not doing well in my constituency, I expect the youth to rise up. I expect people to question why I'm not living up to the mandate that they have given me, why I'm not fulfilling the promises that I made to them when I came for their vote. So let's also look at it in that, in that way. And I go back to 1945 when your colleague students didn't like what was happening in the continent. They rallied, organized themselves, and they, they fought it. Then Ebenezer. Your question is about my incursions I made into what some refer to as benevolent dictators. You are saying that in this era of rights and freedoms, and where people can choose to do whatever they want, why do I want to? I'm not, I'm not talking about limiting people's freedoms and people's human rights, fundamental human rights, in the true and legal sense. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about firm leadership. For example, we all know the elephant in the room now in this Galamsey discussion is that the current president has a golden opportunity. A Kunta mining company has been caught red-handed, caught in the act. We have been rumoring for a long time that politicians are neck deep in this illegal mining business. Now we have a situation where the chairman of your party is clearly undermining all the fight you say you are putting up in this Galamsey matter. A firm leader will say, I don't care whether you are chairman of my party, chairman of my stronghold, I'll deal with you like I'll deal with anybody. That's, that's the kind of, where systems work, where it's not. Because, look, we underestimate what all of this favoritism and, oh, you know, it's my party, it's my family member, what it does, how it destroys society, destroys opportunities. Why other societies, somebody can come from nowhere, a young student can be just on campus, gets a great idea, and we have Facebook, we have Twitter, invented, and that student has protection. Their intellectual property is protected, and they make the money. They can even drop out of school. 
like Bill Gates did. Because the systems work, somebody won't steal that idea and, you know, probably assassinate that person. You know, it's not a jungle. So, so that's what I mean. Firm leadership, where everybody does their work, whether you are the prosecutor, whether you are the DC, whether you are MP, you are minister, you are president, whoever you are, it's about the law must take its course, the systems must work. If you fall foul, they deal with you ruthlessly. I was watching CNN last night. I don't know how many of you saw this. President Biden's son, prosecutors are just about, it was breaking news, they are about to charge him. He may go to jail. Can you believe that? And that's the discussion on CNN. The president of the most powerful country. They are not even scared to have that discussion. Try that here. Even when Galamse Kimpins have been caught, caught in the act. And the names of the companies are always fascinating. You know, Akunta, you know, family and friends and all of that, in-laws. It just tells you the whole mindset. Yeah, we are here for ourselves, so, you know, it's Kokofu football. You know, but we'll have that discussion later. U.S. President, his son, Hunter Biden, and you can read up on it. It was the breaking news, biggest news last night. And you know, you, know, you know his offense? They found out that when he was buying a gun years ago, in filling the form, there is a provision. And by federal law, you must be truthful there. Where if you use drugs, if you are a drug addict, you must fill that and affirm, speak the truth then it disqualifies you from owning the gun. Because you know all the issues they are having with gun control. Uh, you know, lunatics laying hands on guns and then, you know, um, just going on a killing spree. He said no, he does, it's not a drug user, it's not a drug addict, you know. And they found out now, now he's had, he's made confessions himself, you know, about drug use and his drug addiction. They've gone into into the form that he filled when he was buying a gun. And they say he could end up in jail for about five years. You know, and other uh, tax uh, uh, wrongful disclosures. But the main thing is this gun matter. When he was buying a gun, he didn't speak the truth. Can you imagine? US president, they are, they are about to charge him. The investigators are done with their work. And the evidence is ready. And the president dare not intervene. That's what I, that's what I mean. That's what I mean, you know. Uh, firm leadership. And, and you see, look, we've had it before. Going to the history of President Rollins, when he did his school, when he came. Many people don't remember, but President Rollins' own cousin was shot. One of the reasons why the PNDC, that regime, lasted so long, 11 years, well, people saw that, hey, this man is no nonsense. He, he didn't even intervene for his own cousin. So, you know, I, I think we should reflect on it. We should reflect. Our system is too lax. And even us, sometimes we expect it. That is why the toll booths never worked. Because we expect, I mean, it's amazing how our mind works. So we have met today, now we are friends. If you took probably a summer job, uh, manning man the toll booth, and I arrive, and I recognize you. I expect you to tell me, don't pay, just go. I said, oh, so is that how you are? You are mean, you know? You rather trying to do the right thing becomes the bad person. That's how a man works. You know, so that's what I mean. I'm not talking about violating people's rights and all of that, but in a positive way, firm leadership, where we should be, we should be, uh, we, we, should, we should just do what is right and be firm about it. And look, I can cite some more examples. We have a system in this country. Many of you probably don't know about it. Those who import vehicles, when they can't pay their duties, 
the state confiscate the car. And then we auction it cheap. And normally it's political acolytes, you know, people within the family, within their contact space. You know, they go and buy it for cheap. Couldn't, are we not better off asking those people who have taught, struggled, worked, you know how they struggle out there, giving them the first right of the new rate? We don't do that. And why should, for example, I went to court. If you read Samokuja Tua Blackwa versus Jacob H. B. Lamte, I went to court many years ago in 2000. And seven or 2008, against Jacob H. B. Lamte, may he so rest in peace. When I saw in the newspapers that he was buying his bungalow, I argued that no public official, no minister should buy their bungalows. If since in Krumer's time, everybody was buying their duty post, would there be any left for you to come and meet? And I still hold that view. So that kind of firm, you know. There are too many laxities and freebies. And people say, oh, and we, we've even developed expressions for it. Obia didi wonejumahu. So nobody is thinking about the productive match, the industrialization of our country. It's all about a didier, didier, chopping, chopping, and some are chopping little, if you are lucky, others are chopping big. So public office is seen as a certain chopocracy. Obia bedi ako. You know, they are just coming to chop and go. Obia didi wane juma. Those things must, must stop. I mean, for example, when recently judges were embarrassed, when they were, it was reported in the Auditor General's report, I don't know if you people follow the news, they were retiring and they auctioned their cars for them so cheap. Land cruisers, saloon cars, so, so cheap. You don't even buy a third hand Uber car, Uber size small car for that. So, so cheap. You know, and, and it's been going on, it's a practice going on. I don't see why we don't, as a country, we don't buy cars for young teachers, for example, young doctors, young engineers who have graduated, have decided to stay in Ghana and help us. We don't buy cars for them. But then you become a minister, top, top minister, or judge, Supreme Court judge. You are leaving office, then they auction your car for you cheap. Me, I didn't take part in it. All those freebies, I never took part. I don't believe in them. So that's the kind of mindset. Because I always ask myself, if after all the benefits the state has given you, you can't buy a car for yourself, you have to you depend on an auction car, buy it for so cheap. Why? Why? And you feel comfortable. Why should we even have these things there? So that's the kind of strong leader who abolishes all these things. I'm against protocol, for example. When we're at the Ministry of Education, we announce no protocol. What is it? There's any protocol space you give out to somebody who is undeserving, but because he's linked to you, he's a family member, you have denied an ordinary kid from North Town who just didn't have anybody. And that is why that space, that should have gone to him, who has performed better, he couldn't take, that, take up that space. So those are the kind of you know, uh, philosophies that I, I am referring to. The final question from Joseph. Brilliant, brilliant point about our educational curriculum. And it's highly commendable. Um, indeed, when I was asking these questions, I really thought that, you know, it should just be coming just like that. Um, and over there, I think I'll share in the blame. Um, because I've worked at the Ministry of Education before. And we took the view, my boss took the view that Ghana's educational system has not had a period of stability. There have been too many changes rapid changes, four years, three years, and you know, so um, she said during our time, we shouldn't touch anything in terms of curriculum, in terms of duration, let's focus on, uh, on, on just infrastructure, quality, access, and those matters, building e-blocks, 
providing buses, pickups for the schools and all of that. With hindsight, I think that on the matter of curriculum, and particular history, you know, I found out that at some point even history was taken out of the curriculum. It's not, it was not being taught at all. It was not being taught at all. And you see, don't underestimate the power of propaganda. When you don't know your own history, you don't know the, tr the, the truth, sometimes it can even make you become the victim. Have you heard quite dominantly, they say that, oh, this, why are you people complaining about slavery? It's your own people who, so, who handed, handed your, don't, don't you hear that? Oh, there is, it's your fellow blacks who, who handed uh, their fellow blacks to us. And they do it so well, so carefully. Look, Kwame Nkrumah, for example, the greatest leader we've ever had. There's so much propaganda against him. If you don't do your own reading, they try to portray him as a dictator. Uh, he had Kankanya. If you open his fridge, some of the things on the streets, you see dead bodies and all of that. Lies. The power of propaganda. You may even end up going to kill your own mother, as is happening these days. And the priests use it a lot. Those so-called one-man churches, charlatans who have not even been called by uh, the messengers in their hometowns. They say they've been called by God. You know? <laughs> and they say that they say that it is your, your old, poor, and they first check the economic status of your grandmother. You know, if your grandmother is rich, has properties that you'll be inheriting from, she's never a witch. She is not supposed to be banished to the witch camps. It is the poor ones who life has been hard on them. They become witches. And they are responsible for your lack of, you know, progress. You know, so the power of propaganda. And I, I, must, I must salute you, and it's one of the, upon reflection, it's one of the things that if we get the opportunity uh, to be back in control of our education, we must take a second look and a critical look, a deep and broad look at the content of our education. For too long, it's just been about the superficial duration, uh, which building is nice, who built more buildings and all of that. But it's really what is going on in the buildings and the content of the, the curriculum. So uh, as we talk about the power of propaganda, there's a last video that I want us to watch. Interesting confessions from the CIA uh, about the power of propaganda. And that question really lays the foundation. There are other functions, however, some of them more legitimate than others. So this is John One Stockwell, is to run secret a wars, CIA director. The covert action that's written and talked about so much, like what's happening in Nicaragua today from Honduras. Another thing is to disseminate propaganda to influence people's minds. And this is a major function of the CIA. And uh, unfortunately, of course, it overlaps into the gathering of information. You, you have contact with a journalist, you will give him true stories, you'll get information from him, you'll also give him false stories. Did you do buy his confidence with true stories? You buy his confidence and set him up. We've seen this happen in, uh, recently with Jack Anderson, for example, who, who has his intelligence sources, and he has also admitted that he's been set up by them. You know, every fifth story just simply being false. Uh, you also work on their human vulnerabilities to recruit them in a classic sense, to make them your agent so that you can control what they do, so you don't have to set them up sort of, you know, by, by putting one over on them. So you can say, here, plant this one next Tuesday. Can you do this with responsible reporters? Yes, the church committee brought it out in 1975, and then Woodward and Bernstein put an article in Rolling Stone a couple of years later. Uh, 400 journalists cooperating with the CIA, uh, including some of the biggest names in the business, mm -hmm. to consciously introduce the stories into the press. Well, give me a concrete example of how you use the press this way, how a false story is planted and how you got it published. Well, for example, in my, my war, the Angola War that I helped to manage, 
uh, one third of my staff was propaganda. Ironically, it's called covert action inside the CIA. Outside, that means the violent part. Uh, I had propagandists all over the world, principally in London, Kinshasa, and Zambia. We, were, we would take stories which we would write and put them in the Zambia Times and then pull them out and send them to a, a journalist on our payroll in Europe but his cover story, you see, would be that he, would, he had gotten them from his stringer in Lusaka who had gotten them from the Zambia Times. We had the complicity of the government of Zambia, Kenneth Kaunda, if you will, to put these false stories into his newspapers. But after that point, the journalists, uh, Reuters and AFP, uh, the management was not witting of it. Now, our contact man in Europe was, and we pumped l just, just dozens of stories about Cuban atrocities, Cuban rapists, uh, in one case, we had the Cuban rapists caught uh, and tried by the Ovimbundu maidens who had been their victims, and then we ran photographs that made almost every newspaper in the country of the Cubans being executed by the Ovimbundu women who supposedly had been their victims. But you, these were and, fake photos? Oh, absolutely. We didn't know of one single atrocity committed by the Cubans. It was pure, raw, false propaganda to, to create a an illusion of communists, you know, eating babies for breakfast and that sort of totally false propaganda. Yeah, the power of propaganda and uh, the CIA uses it actively and uh, you need to be conscious of it. So we can take the last round of questions. Um, I know there are so many questions. Unfortunately, time is oh, run time out. Time is up. Yes. Oh, but I promise my Afro friend, so... Okay, uh, please, so we can give a special dispensation yes, for that I question. I don't uh, want to be accused of making a... Yes, yeah, so he, can he you... Needs a mic. You want a mic, right, okay. Yeah. Class rep, your work is not done, you went to sit down. What is he? Um, so, uh, whilst you were speaking, you said a lot of stuff about like Russia supporting the, like when Kwame Nkrumah was talking about everyone having missiles or no one having, the Russian scientists came to help Africa. You spoke about how they came to help the South Africans during the apartheid. So I just wanted to know if you were like, you were trying to, you were like you are a supporter of the Russians not necessarily as like their actions against the Ukrainians by trying to invade them, but I don't know if I don't know if you against me. But then I'm asking if you are you support the Russians, and if you if if that's the case, I also wanted to know if you agree with the Indian politician in the first video you showed us, who was trying, who was saying that he doesn't support the USA and U, and the UK because of what they did to India, even though what India was doing to Pakistan is, is similar actions to what Russia is doing to Ukraine, where they invaded the, U the Pakistanis because they were trying to annex the two countries. Very brilliant question. And uh, it's unfortunate we don't have time. I really, I really will need at least one hour for this discussion. First of all, it is not about liking Russia or liking America or liking India or Pakistan and all of that. It is about the principle. It's about the principle. And then it is about your allies in the pursuit of that principle. So I made a point that the Russians understood Kwame Nkrumah's philosophy. When Kwame Nkrumah said that, look, for this world to be safe, nobody should have nuclear weapons, or we should all have it. Why is it that America doesn't want other countries having nuclear weapons? They claim, oh, their democracy is not good enough. Oh, they may elect a crazy leader. They may... Why do you think that that can happen? See what that can happen in their country. 
Who will have thought that they will elect a president who will refuse to hand over? Who won't attend his own handover ceremony? Who actually staged a coup? If it was Africa, they would have given it all kinds of names. They tried to polish theirs nicely. Oh, insurrection. Oh, crazy Trump. He was having a bad day. You know, they didn't want to leave office. You know, it's presented, you know, very nicely in flowery language. So, if a country like Russia at the time agrees with you and says that, yes, though we have it, we don't mind if other African countries do have it, so that then everybody, because the only way, it's turning out, that the only way to protect all, look at North Korea. So every now and then he does a missile testing to remind everybody in the world that I have it. <laughs> you better be careful. You know, you may not like my punk and my height and uh, how big my trousers is, but you better be careful, you know. Uh, I am Kim Jong-un and I can, you know, fire a missile into, 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 into your airspace. And though Trump initially tried to attack him verbally, calling him little rocket man and all of that, you know, he ran to have peace talks with him. You know, so Kwame Nkrumah has been vindicated that the only way for global peace is either we all destroy ours or we all have it. So a principle like that, I support the principle. I agree with the logic of it. And if countries like the West, and by the way, it has been confirmed, and you can research on this, it's, it's been totally confirmed. There is a book by Mahoney, who was a CIA director. Mahoney is the name. You can, you can look it up. Uh, it's been confirmed that the CIA was behind Kwame Nkrumah's overthrow. They sponsored the 1966 coup. There's a latest book that came out this year by a British scholar that also establishes that. The declassified CIA files have all confirmed. So you need to have that nuance, that understanding. Now, if you go into the Russia-Ukraine war, you must not begin from 24 February when the bombs were dropped. You must go back into why we are where we are. This was a needless provocation, a needless war, which could have been avoided. I don't want to be seen as a supporter of Russia. I don't want to be seen as a supporter of Ukraine. I am for principles. That's the point I'm making. The principle is that countries protect their territorial space and they want to be sure what is happening around their boundaries. Remember that when the USSR broke away, then the, all of these countries, Ukraine you know, became an independent state. However, NATO, who are enemies to Russia, were consciously and actively courting Ukraine. You know that. And Ukraine elected a pro-American president, Vladimir Zelensky, who clearly, you know, uh, has not exhibited that high level, you know, leadership and skill that one would have expected, which could have avoided this. And why do I say that? Many researchers and analysts had warned that if Ukraine, if Kiev forms an unholy alliance with NATO, it could spark this conflict. Learning from history, once again, I'm talking about the principle. In 1962, the Americans were mad, they were crazy when they found out that the Russians had aligned with Cuba, very close to, just next door to Florida. That's where Cuba is. You can check them up. And they were establishing a military base in Cuba. That is what led to the 1962 missile crisis. We were on the verge of Third World War. The Americans said, hell no. The Russians had to quickly pull out. So how is it that, as for you, America, you don't like your enemy coming close to you, using your neighbor as a base? 
but you want the Russians to accept that. So you see, I talk about the principle. You see, we have to be consistent. Of course, you can condemn uh, Putin's approach, the, the, the bloodletting, the atrocities. Too many people have died and all of that. But could this not have been avoided? So we are intellectuals. We are in a university. I don't like to just fall for the Western propaganda. Oh, this guy is a killer. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's, 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 he's a bomber. Putin deserves to be in jail, you know. And look at the people who are talking about invaders. Who invaded Afghanistan? Was it Russia? Was it Putin? Who invaded Iraq? I'm talking about modern invasions. You forget about our own invasion, which we were talking about, you know, in the 13th century all the way down to the, the, the 19th century. Uh, who, who, who is invading Palestine? So it's the principle. It's a principle. <laughs> you know, and sometimes the hypocrisy. What I will not accept. As for you, you should accept it. And their own foreign, former foreign minister, the most distinguished foreign minister, Kissinger. I want you to read up on him, on Kissinger. Kissinger wrote an article, which is online, warning about what Russia would do if ever Ukraine decides to align with NATO and becomes too pali-pali with America. So as I said, I can go on and on. There are more nuances. The Western propaganda will not allow you, if you don't cut through it and get to the bottom of the issues and the genesis and the, the anthropology of these matters, you will be, you'll just fall for uh, one side of the propaganda. So please, I will ad admonish you as young intellectuals, just pursue knowledge ferociously and get to try to understand why things happen, why things have taken place the way they, they, they have. And let's look for the principle and pursue the principle. I think that when you pursue principle, you see, principle is indivisible. Principle doesn't discriminate. When you follow a principled position, it would not really matter whether it's Russia today, America tomorrow, you know, and all of that. So that is, that is the view I take, and I hope that I have been clear. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Honorable. So um, just like we do, uh, or we did from last semester, the university has um, a little gift of souvenirs to be presented to our guest lecturer. So I'll ask um, Josephine to do the presentation and then I'll ask um, Yesmin to do the vote of thanks. Okay. So let's put our hands together for Josephine. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ah, no, no, no photographer. Bless, come and take some pictures. I want my social media followers to know that uh, I received some kindness when I came here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, we can, we can use this. Can use okay. this. I'm sure we will share that. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, what's our class rep? Okay. Josephine? Uh, yes, man, right? Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, and I hope you all enjoyed the seminar. Thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank Mr. Samuel Blackwell for taking time out of his hectic schedule to share his inspirational thoughts with us on leadership and morality. So once again, thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you next week. Thank you very much. So um, the social media team wants us to take a group picture with our guest lecturer outside, just here. So we'll do that quickly.
Come back in and I'll mark your register, your attendance. Well, if you want, you can go when you finish. Yeah, so that one you can decide.